So Barry, thanks for your time. I think it's going to be really interesting for people to hear your career journey and especially being um, uh, ultimately an owner of an, an IT reseller, right? So how you've gone from where you started out to where you are today and, and the highs and lows on that journey be really interesting. So as a starting point, can you introduce yourself and, and who you are and what you do? Yeah, so my name is Barry Coombs. I'm Chief Technologist and, as you mentioned, co-owner for an IT reseller based in the UK called Computer World Systems Limited. Fantastic. And so where, where, did, where did your career start out? Um, well, if, if I take you back to the, the dark days of secondary school and, and you kind of have to make a choice as to kind of where is your career going to go. And I, I had two passions. One was technology and the other one was cooking. And I had yeah, to decide same. whether I want, <laughs> wanted to become a chef or getting involved in IT. And um, I didn't like the idea of working Christmas. So that kind of uh, cut out the idea of being a chef quite quickly um, and really focused on, on technology from that point. And um, I've got people in my fam uh, family, my grandfather and uh, my mum was always uh, quite interested with technology. Um, so I was kind of brought up with that intrigue of uh, technology and what to do, really. Um, and, and after going through uh, college and, um, and part of university, I did a HND uh, in computing and business. Um, I um, got a job with a, a software house, uh, a company that specialised in global positioning systems, uh, tracking anything and everything from um, bullion wagons to buses to anything generally over the UK. But it was um, it was certainly a very interesting time. Started on the service desk. Uh, we were tracking Mondial uh, recovery vehicles at the time. So anyone with a BMW, Mercedes, Land Rover, we were responsible for the, the hardware in those vehicles that got the jobs out to the, the end users. Um, and we had some uh, quite interesting projects. And I, and I worked my way through that organization, was uh, focusing on becoming a DBA. I was uh, being shadowed, uh, shadowing someone that was a, a SQL DBA and, and found quite a lot of interest in um, not just SQL, but how you could get value out of the data that was in SQL. And I was able to come uh, bring that together with some very basic coding skills I had to create some kind of diagnostic tools that helped us figure out where we needed to be sending engineers. Um, but then I kind of um, uh, had the opportunity to um, look at some other technologies. We were acquired by a Canadian company uh, that kind of went out there and bought transport uh, associated technologies. They were very acquisition hungry and we were responsible for the European side of that acquisition afterwards. Um, I became a domino administrator for a while. I was that, <laughs> I was the hated person when a company was acquired, I was sent in to go and move them from exchange to domino. Um, so the opposite way to everyone was going at the time. Um, and that was certainly interesting. Um, and then uh, the opportunity came up for this project where there was 24 developers. We needed to have a um, development stack that had both server and front end components. Um, and this was probably about 15 years ago. And someone said, oh, you should look at this thing that I've heard called virtualization. There's a product, uh, VMware Virtual Infrastructure 3.0 that was out at the time. And we put together a virtual infrastructure um, and also a Citrix environment before VDI even existed, where we were hosting XP desktops, brokered through Citrix presentation server, hosted on a VMware infrastructure. And it, it, I was just really interested by it. And then from then, I, um, I decided that I wanted to be more involved in that world of solution design, solution implementation. I joined Computer World at that point. So um, that, that first job was pivotal to me. It, it, it was so varied. I think when you're on a support role, you kind of get your head, oh, God, I've got another ticket to deal with, how many tickets I've got to do. But I look back now and uh, I've got customers such as Bank of England, National Air Traffic Control that I dealt with all at that time um, that I learned so much in that early part of my career. Yeah, I think it's a fairly common trait that I've heard across a lot of these sessions is people starting out in that, that support role, right? Understanding the, the, the challenges of being an end user and then progressing through into ultimately architecture, design, pre-sales and management roles because they understand the challenges that come through all those areas and what customers expect rather than just being born and bred into the architecture world where actually you, you may be a little bit out of touch to what people are actually thinking and experiencing. Definitely. I think it is a really important step in the career and, and an area where you can really kind of cut your teeth and take the time to understand the users and not just the technology. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think the whole thing around culture, user experiences and making sure that we can make people more productive is quite key and especially in the current time frames that we're in with with people working from home anywhere anytime and all that kind of stuff how do we how do we make things secure and seamless for them rather than secure and 
completely intrusive and doesn't work for them, um, yeah. right? Which is a, a fairly common thing I've heard over various customer conversations. I mean, certainly 15 years ago, I could get away with technology for technology's sake. I know people that deploy technologies inside their business just to get it listed on their CV to allow them future career progression. Yeah. We simply can't get away with that in this day and age, and, and nor, nor should we want to. Um, it is all around aligning it to the business, aligning it to the user's needs. Um, it's no longer this kind of blind science that we can kind of tell someone it's what it needs to be done. We've got to be able to create that business case and use case for it. Yeah, I definitely 100% agree with that. So what does a, what does a day in the life of Barry look like now? It's very different. So, so um, uh, as I said, I progressed then on, on to, to uh, computer world um, and uh, started there again on the service desk, moved over, but also doing some consultancy around VMware and Citrix from that newfound skill set I had. Um, and then I've done every role from a technical perspective inside computer world um, to uh, be make it to the board. And, and unfortunately, the, the founder of our business at the time passed away um, and we had the opportunity to create a board uh, to, to to, to take the business on to its next stage and, and, and lucky enough to be part of the small team that then went through MBO. So kind of been through uh, the, that whole journey through to pre-sales um, and now um, uh, chief technologist is probably the, the most apt title for what I do, but with a small business, you, you get, you dig in where you can. So yeah. um, generally where I'm focused on today, so I head up uh, responsibility for the pre-sales team and I've got a fantastic team uh, with a fantastic manager that works underneath me. Lucky enough that a number of us have uh, been able to achieve the expert status for such a small partner we've got some really good skills um, and I'm really lucky with the people that I work with um, I also head up marketing my belief is very much that marketing is all about giving value to our customers mm -hmm. um, so very much that's why marketing sits with me being a, a blogger and a podcaster and all those kind of things it was how can we leverage the knowledge that we have in-house to be sharing that with the wider community um, but I also from an innovation perspective I like to still be involved with that so whilst I'm not involved in that much architecture from a day-to-day -day perspective at the moment. It's looking at that next generation of technology. Um, I, I jump back in to figure out how we can mature a product, how we can do it. I like to get that real life experience by doing some of those projects myself. And then it looks to be how we can then package that up, everything that we've learned, make sure that it's then rolled out so the rest of the business can uh, deliver it so I can then go on to the next stage. So it's the future strategy for the business. It's the general operational elements, but it's also being that kind of high level executive that can have the yeah. C-level conversations to build relationships with our customers. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's a, there's a lot of situations now where the title CTO or chief technologist now is banded around so much that it's become diluted to what it actually is now right and it's the reason why i asked the question of what is it that, that, that you do because if i speak to one cto or chief technologist and i speak to yourself and then another one it's very different depending on the organization they're in and and whether it's very sales focused marketing focused technical focus whether it's a large small organization and the, the role varies so much and i know that when i started out, i had this I, I still have this aspiration but i have this aspiration at some point to become some kind of technical director cto kind of role right and yeah. but over the last maybe three years, I've sat back and thought, well, if I put the title to a side for a moment, what is it that I actually want to do? Yeah. Rather than chase the title, right? And when you actually sit down and think about it, and I think my role in CDW now is, is a practice lead for, for high performance on how we um, build strategies for customers, right? And for our own internal um, go to markets and things. That's as, probably as close to a CTO role I can get without sitting on a board almost. I make decisions for the business. I do financial planning. I hire and, and um, accrue talent and making sure that they get developed in the right ways. I make sure we do budget management and all those kind of things, which is all part and parcel of some kind of management and, and CXO position from a technical point of view, just without the tip box. Yeah, so it's definitely. kind of like, what, what is it that, that I'm personally aspiring to be, right? And I think that is important. It is important to understand what drives you and what motivates you. Um, and certainly this is an element for me as I kind of mature and change in my career um, that I'm looking at. And, and one of the key areas that I see for me moving forward in the next step of my career is being able to help others on that journey, to be able to coach and mentor them. Um, so certainly in the last 12 months myself, I've uh, undertaken uh, NLP qualification. So I'm now uh, an NLP practitioner. Um, I'm currently um, going through a program to become a motiv motivational maps practitioner. So that means that I can help people uh, understand what their motivations are, yeah. what their weaknesses are, the demotivators and the motivators to help Making them kind of like, and all that kind of stuff, right? Exactly. So, so I'm, see I'm seeing that kind of maturity of both a coach 
but also the technologist is very important to me. But mm -hmm. as you quite rightly pointed out, just achieving the, the technical director or uh, CTO, there, there are other things that come with that that won't be for everyone. I spend a lot of my time uh, with kind of HR, sort of people management kind of things. And if you're a real technologist, that may be something that doesn't really appeal to you that much. And whilst the idea of it maybe appeals to you, the reality of it maybe doesn't. So it's about kind of understanding what you want to achieve and, and being happy with that rather than just chasing that title, as you said. Yeah, and I think touching on that point, right, where there's certain things in the role you might not want to do, right? So if we think about that, being a chief technologist or working with HR and all those kind of things, extremely technical people, like really detailed technical people are generally making a very broad statement here, but they're generally not the kind of people that would be managing a team and being more team mentality, right? They yeah. would be more focused on the task at hand rather than the, the, the wider, greater good kind of scenario. And I think that's where as, as technical individuals that, and I, I know I've been saying this to a few people in my team and then a few other individuals that I've been talking to outside of CDW is that what is it you want to achieve? Why do you want to achieve it? What are you actually doing now that's different to that? But then more importantly, what value does that give to the organization you currently work for if it's something you don't do today? Because if you can't justify that, that positive outcome for the business, then it may be time to look elsewhere or readjust your alignment to where you want to end up as well. Definitely. And people are all on a journey. And I think one of the things that is important that people do come and go from an organization, I think we can have a very uh, personal attachment. And, and certainly, I've, I've got some fantastic people in my organization, I wouldn't ever want, want them to leave. But people are on a journey and people do have uh, different things uh, that they want to achieve uh, during that career. So, um, but I think you're, you're very right in what you're saying, just because you're a great technologist doesn't mean that you would be a great technology manager. And um, we see the same, I, I work very closely with the sales team at computer and because you're a great salesperson doesn't mean you'd be a great sales manager there are different skill sets that are needed and it doesn't need to be the pinnacle of your career is getting to a point where actually you, it's not something that suits you or is right for you anymore so it is important i think to in, in anything that anyone's doing is think well, actually what makes you happy what do you want to achieve what ticks your boxes What's and your go passion? for and go for that it's actually passion energy motivation uh, are all really important things for someone to be looking at and and, and certainly my mantra has always been is is i, I give 110 percent or 100 percent if um you can't go so someone said to me in my past career barry whatever you do never give more than 70 <laughs> percent and, and i said well why would i do that and he said well if you always give 70 percent, then you can always surprise them by giving it a little bit more if you need to but otherwise just rest of it and, and i didn't like that I'm, I'm the type of person that look if i'm going to do something i'm going to put my all into it and and the reason i have been able to achieve what i have i've put down to that is because i'm passionate i'm here to do it i'm I'm not driven by money. It's nice, don't get me wrong. We, we all like to be able to have a certain lifestyle. I'm driven by the satisfaction of doing a good job, by learning something, by being able to think that I've helped someone. I've helped organizations that we, we, we know every day that we probably interact with every day. I've been part of their technical journey that's made something possible for them. Those are the things that tick the boxes for me. So it is important to make sure that you are looking for those motivations um, and you are aligning with that. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And I think on that, I think um, so. I noticed the other day. I think it was on social media. It's got a three fifty Z. I think it yes. was. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, classic, awesome car. Yeah. The only downside is you should have got a Honda S two thousand. Personal opinion. Uh, I don't know. Well, <laughs> so, so, and I think that's um, obviously to, to to segue into. Uh, the times that we're in at the moment. I, I've always had a, a very nice uh, car, put a ton of miles on it every year kind of thing. And um, no doubt I, I, I will go back to, to going to one of the dealerships and, and getting a, a brand new car at some point. But at the moment I cycle more than I drive. Everything's working from home. Um, and, and, and I am a petrol head as much as my next work car will probably be an electric car. Um, I am a petrol head, so I do like the, the the sound of a V6, V8 or something like that. So so yeah, no, I certainly looked at uh, all the cars that were were available in that price range. And yeah, like, like the, the instant power of the 350Z over yeah. them working an S2000, but- uh, yeah, Screaming yeah, up the band. <laughs> exactly, they're, they're all fantastic cars of that era. And um, I've never been a classic car man, but, but I'm probably, I'm, 350Zs and S2000 aren't classic cars, but if you ask some of the other well, kids, well, almost forgetting that, I just are. sold my S2000 recently and um, changed to well, I, I just basically um, had a midlife crisis early or, or growing into old age, one or the other, and gone and got a Harley Davidson. Oh, very um, nice. So I'm now poodling around on a on a on a lovely uh, Harley Davidson, making so lots that's of. That's why you're growing out the beard, is it? 
I did have a really long beard a few weeks <laughs> back and I, uh, I realised I looked extremely unhealthy and it just didn't suit me and my wife didn't like it, so it went. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, so if we think about the industry and when you, you decided to join technology industry specifically, wh why? why? Why technology and why, why not the cookery, right? Because I was the same. I, I was in secondary school and I was thinking, right, I want to be a chef, same mm. as yourself. Or I want to be in IT. I didn't know what exactly in IT, but something to do with computers, right? And I decided that personally cooking and being a chef wasn't for me one because the unsociable hours, I prefer to eat food more than anything else. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea of cooking food and then giving it to someone else really didn't sit well with me. Uh, and I remember this is like a few years ago where I was sat there thinking, well, maybe I could create a, a restaurant that would be technology infused with food. Still think that would be a bad idea because internet cafes never took off right uh, <laughs> and things like that so there were the kind of things i was um, really interested in a chinese restaurant in covent garden i don't know if you've been there that um they project the menu onto the table and then once you're done with ordering the stuff on the table you then play games on it and stuff like that i can't remember what it's called it's just around the back of uh, covent garden but uh, yeah, yeah certainly yeah. interesting yeah so, so so why did you make the choice of technology then what, what, what pushed you that way in the end I, I am someone that kind of I, I, I'm fed by that constant need to discover that constant need to learn I really do like that and I think technology ticked that bubble even from the early days there was always something there to go and do and I was very interested in coding to a certain degree I, I, I call myself and, and the word isn't right I'm a, I'm a hacker but but not the hacker in the, the general means I will find a piece of code I will find something that works and I will tweak it I will hack it to, to make it do what I want to do so I spent a lot of time doing um, a website design PHP ASP um, all, all things that are simpler so I like to create things um, and I saw a technology as a really good way to do that um, I don't know, I've always, I'm a bit of a magpie, been attracted to that, that technology side of things and, and learning. And, and I found, found out very early that I had a passion to helping people with technology, being able to simplify it. And, and I think still today, whilst I'm not on the service desk helping people directly, it is all about how can I simplify that? And certainly my role, um, if I've got a consultant's hat on today, is more around talking to organisations from a business perspective and helping them understand the benefits that the technology could deliver to them if adopted in the right way yeah. um, a lot of organizations still just deploy something like microsoft 365 just for the sake of well we've got to do that it's the next thing to do exactly it's yeah. office but it, you're not taking that time to actually think actually how could it really help the organization and the users yeah and the, the amount of conversations that we have with people around just office 365 and m365 in general that they sit there and go yeah yeah we've deployed that well, which part of it oh we've yeah. got word we've got excel we've got this and like that's fantastic that's just like office tiniest part of yeah. it right what about everything else? And like, well, yeah, no, we haven't done that yet. Why? I don't know what to do with it exactly. And, and I think things for me, like utilizing the power platform to automate citizen app dev kind of scenarios, getting putting productivity in the hands of the users because people are now becoming a lot more tech savvy as people come from university into business yeah. to allow them to do things that make them more productive. And I think I've been working a lot with, with financial institutes recently and specifically traders, right? And my mindset initially was traders are people that buy and sell shares and all that kind of stuff. They're actually developers most mm -hmm. of them. They write their own algorithms to check the market and do certain things and all that kind of stuff. And the kind of intricacies of technology that they use as individuals is, it blew my mind thinking going in there as a kind of a blinkered view of that they're just there to buy and sell shares. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was amazing to see that. So what, what would you say is the most memorable moment so far in your career? I, I always go back to some of those early parts uh, of my career and, and whilst uh, uh, I, I don't think I can go into specifics, although it, it's quite a long time away, doing projects for people like National Air Traffic Control, al although they were um, quite simplistic technologies at the time and actually quite legacy technologies as I look back to that, looking um, and having the knowledge as to how technology is applied into some of those environments um, and, and Bank of England and, and other people uh, like that, whilst they're not technologies that any of those organisations are using today, I think it's always quite interesting to understand what goes on behind the 
the scenes. And certainly we've got some retail customers today that I go in and use their shops. And as my card's going through the machine, I always kind of just pause and go, I hope that card goes through and it doesn't happen because I know what goes on from the moment that goes through the till all the way back to that payment being processed. So I I think that the the biggest achievement is those kind of times where you are able to look back and you know that something you have implemented has made a real change or is supporting something um, so, that is so critical to, to people that are using it. Yeah, and along the way, right, we make many mistakes, right? and we, we hopefully learn from those mistakes, but is there any any mistake that's maybe worth mentioning that, that you had a, a really good lesson learned from that's worth sharing with everyone? Um, I, I can't think of any kind of uh, major fo- uh, fo- faux pas, but uh, clearly there, there, there's been a raft of, uh, of things that do creep up in your career. But the thing that I always go back to that's probably made me uh, overly cautious was being remoted into an environment up in Glasgow when I was down in the southwest of the UK, applying some upgrades on it. And then all of a sudden you go to reboot it and realize you've shut it down. Now in the virtual world, that's not so much of a problem kind of thing. Um, but when you've got a system that's supporting um, uh, quite a large requirement back 15 years ago, probably didn't have ILOs or IDRAX or whatever configured on it. I've accidentally shut down a server that sat in Glasgow that is supporting a major infrastructure. Yeah, it, it, it makes you then think on those future upgrades and the future things that you, you do. Um, am I clicking the right button here? Is this going to do it? Because yeah, yeah it, it, quite at that point, quite a lot of commotion to be able to find someone in Glasgow that has the <laughs> appropriate permission to go and turn it back on. And and we've all been there in, in a data center, accidentally turned off the wrong host and 50 VMs have gone down that shouldn't have gone down or something like yeah, that. Yeah, even my, like when I was in, doing internal IT before I came into the channel and I was managing a fairly large Citrix environment and using the CMC, I went in and told it to do a patch for what yeah. I in my mind put in this 9 p.m. at night and didn't use 24 hour clock and at 9 a.m. in the morning when everyone was logging on it decided to start doing its scheduled maintenance and yeah. <laughs> that also at that time I was sat having a, a lovely poached egg on toast in the work canteen so I wasn't even aware it was happening <laughs> um but yeah there's those categories you, you learn from those lessons you double check and uh, you I, I, grow I, from it I, I made a horrible mistake once when I was uh, doing a bit more of uh, Cisco networking. I put a brand new edge switch into a customer's environment, um, which unfortunately uh, the Cisco discovery protocol um, and uh, all the VLAN database got copied from the new switch to the rest of the stack rather than from the stack to the new such. I, it was one of those kind of things, oh, it's just an edge switch. I'll do it in the middle of the day. It won't be a problem. And I took down a whole call center, the phone system, all the servers, because <laughs> the VLAN database got overwritten to the whole infrastructure. Luckily, I managed to identify what had happened very quickly and got everything back up within 30 seconds. But it was that moment where you plug it in and then all of a sudden you hear the phone stop ringing. You hear all the commotion going on and everyone going, what's going on? <laughs> oh, no, I know what that is. And you go and correct it very quickly. Well, I think, I think on that point, though, right, I think with the way that the industry has been going over the last few years where everything's becoming more GUI based and wizard driven, I think the, the, the knowledge of technical individuals is becoming less and less um, skilled because mm-hmm. if in, the, in, in those scenarios, right, you were doing it in command line, you knew exactly what you were doing in a lot of cases. And if there was a problem, you had to troubleshoot it, you know, how to get all the logs out and review those logs and maybe do some Wireshark and capture it and find out what's going on and all those kind of things. And what we find now is a lot of, up and coming technical people just sit there and go, well, I don't know that because it doesn't do that in the Azure GUI or it doesn't do that in the AWS GUI or whatever it might be. And I think with this concept of moving towards infrastructure as code and this DevOps mentality, I think people are going to be forced now to understand those intricacies a bit more um, than what people maybe have been doing over the last few years where it's been more mm-hmm. driven a lot of the time. So I'm really I, looking I, forward to that because I think it's going to foster a new breed of technical people that actually know what's happening rather than the guys that just bash buttons and watch things happen. I, I think we've kind of got um, a bit of uh, further diversification to happen in tech because I think there's been a lot of generalists that uh, touching on those technical skills many of us have had in the past we've been able to do that and um, I think going forward with technology going more to the cloud I think there are going to be those individuals that are going to be more DevOps orientated that are going to be deep code and I think that's one way you can go I think the other way you can go is being much more business aligned much more user centric um, and maybe not have that deep knowledge but know how to translate that technology and then you've kind of got the people in the middle that maybe know a little bit of tech a little bit of business I don't think that middle place is a good place to be there is a good place to to 
for those people. But I, I think if you kind of want that real career pro progression, you want to stand out, I would highly recommend that you kind of think, actually, am I a, a, a DevOps type person? Am I going to be looking at Ansible and uh, Chef Puppet, all of those kind of things for automating um, infrastructure troubleshooting them, being able to go and do that? Or am I going to be more business aligned? Am I going to be more kind of chief techno technologist rather than chief development officer? Yeah. Am I going into that area that is more around the alignment and the application of technology and the innovation with technology? rather than hands-on or are you going to be the the, the lead service desk uh, guy that is able to do a bit of all of that kind of thing yeah and I remember when I was um, sitting on the fence between hands-on consultant very technically um, astute versus going into pre-sales architecture where mm. it's a little bit more high level in a lot of cases and I remember my manager at the time sitting there saying that you, you can't sit on the fence here you have to do one or the other mm. because if you don't, you're going to become overworked, you're going to become stressed, you're going to start to get frustrated because you've got it right in your mind, a deep, no le low level information, but we don't need that right now. All we need yeah. is this. And so people transitioning from like consultancy roles where they've been used to being very IP based, host name, widget this, widget that, to them being conceptual design, HLD kind of people that are sat in a, like a, an architectural pre sales team. There's a lot of people that, that think it's a lot easier, but that transition into that high level view of the world and not giving all that detail in day one is, it is an art form, I think. And I think it's something that a lot of people do struggle with. Yeah. Um, even, even myself at times, right? It's easy for us to want to go into the detail and showcase how much we know. Mm. Um, when actually it's, it's holding that back and just, just letting little bits of information out all the time. It's about um, applying that context to the conversation all the time when, when it comes to something like pre-sales, because as you say, at certain times, it is the right thing to do to, to show your understanding and show what's going on. But if you kind of go deep technical in front of your average CTO or CIO or whatever, they really do not care. What they care about is actually how is this aligning to the business? What is this going to cost us? What yeah. is the pain going to be on that journey? And then they will want to dig on the certain bits. So you've got to be able to be that chameleon and be the right person to the right time but yeah. again it's just about I, I don't think there's any right path for any individual it's about understanding what matters to you and then don't think that the pinnacle of your career is going all the way up here and doing that because certain things won't be right for certain people you use the the, the talents and the passions that you have to take you on your journey yeah and I think um one of the guys I was interviewing the other evening said that it's just be willing to give something a go Right. Don't be the person that sits there and goes, mm, I'm not too sure because you'll watch the opportunity go by and then you'll sit there and go, oh, I wish I'd done that actually. Yeah. When actually if you'd have given it a go and failed, the worst case scenario is you fall back into the role you were in. Yeah. Right. Where you know you're happy and you're skilled and you can upsell the value to your current employer or a new employer if needs be. I, I think the, the, the best thing is make sure you're always an open book because I think technologists can be too... We, we, we can be very process driven, we can be very technical driven, we know what is possible, we know what we're doing, we know what happens next. And what that can do is that can limit your imagination, that can limit the innovation and the scope that you've got. Whereas if you go into something with an open mind, not already thinking that you know the answers or you know the limitations, and capture actually what difference could be made if we were able to do X, Y and Z. Because then you don't know what's changed since yesterday. Just because something wasn't possible yesterday doesn't mean that today or tomorrow that thing couldn't be released and you could release a huge amount of value for yourself as an individual, for your organization or your customer. So it's kind of having that vision, having that openness and having that willingness to constantly kind of assess where you are and what could be, uh, what could be possible. Yeah, definitely. So on the journey that you've had, do you think you've made any sacrifices along the way? I, I, I'm uh, so um, I'm a big uh, advocate for mental health and, and well-being, um, and I think certainly a, a, an element from my perspective is um, I have struggled with that disconnection from work-life balance. I have certainly prioritised work over personal life uh, on that journey, um, and I think that is something that we we all should be more aware of. Um, uh, think about how we can prioritise ourselves a little bit more over than uh, getting work done, or, or, or equally over others. It's kind of that analogy when you're on an aeroplane, and if if there is a mayday and you go 
going down, sort yourself out before you sort your children out. There's no <laughs> point kind of getting their gas mask on if, if you're not going to be able to, to look after yourself kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so so I, I think that is an area, I, I'm lucky that I've not had any serious problems in that area, but it's certainly, certainly something that I reflect on and something that I continually work on to make sure that I am able to make that disconnection from a work environment and look after myself from a, from a mental health and wellbeing perspective. I think even more so in this current time frame where we're going back into lockdown right in, in a couple of days time and for as much as people think that well it's not much different than we have now well it is because we haven't got the weather now mm. right it's like we had in the last in the in the first wave yeah people have been doing this for a long time they've not had the same social interaction people that are working remotely may still be being productive but what generally people have found is that people are working longer they're doing more they're not switching off they're not taking their annual leave to reset themselves and all that kind of stuff and i think People really need to look at it and go, right, I need to take my leave. I need to take a break. Go go for a walk during the day. St- sit up, get a sit and stand desk if you can, so you can do a bit of movement rather than just sitting in the same chair all day. As a manager as well, I, I really think people should advocate having their team calls as a walking call. Tell everyone to get the trainers on on a coat and go for a walk and leave your laptops and things behind. Have your phone in, maybe your AirPods so you can do your call whilst walking, but go and get some fresh air while you're doing your team call because Definitely. you don't need to be sat in front of a machine. Yeah, no, it's so important. And um, I became a mental health first aider uh, 18 months or so ago. And, and I've done a lot of stuff in that space. But it is, it is an area that I think increasingly people are suffering with, as you say, lockdown and everything we've been through so far this year and, and probably will be for another year or more, to be honest, if, mm. uh, if we're honest about this. Um, really does change our view on the world. And, and we do need to kind of reflect on how is it affecting our mental health? Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. And if we were looking at Barry starting out, right, and you were going to give yourself some tips from from now, what what would those three tips be? Um. So I think earlier on, in, early on in your career, you, you kind of you're on a mission to find out what matters to you so first of all you've got to be open don't have preconceptions as to where you want to be I want to be a website designer everything I was doing I was being a website designer until my university course got cancelled and I got changed to being a business uh, IT uh, course rather than uh, a website design course um, so, so you have that open mind and learn from your experiences really take um, look for the opportunities during that um, uh, stage to be able to kind of shadow different people that are doing different roles to learn from other people mm-hmm. um, to understand actually what works for you, what ticks and stuff like that. Um, I, I think the next thing for, for me would be to find your community. Once you know your niche or you find an area that you're working with um, increasingly, find your community. For me, the VMware community was uh, a massive growth in my career. It allowed me to uh, have a stage to be able to highlight my skill and um, passion uh, not only to the community but also internally I was able to go look this is the awareness that I'm getting from the community how can I use these newfound recognitions to our customers and to help promote the business um, and importantly once you found your community don't just take from that community yeah. uh, 11, 11 years ago that was uh, the main reason I was seeing Duncan Epping and Frank and Alan Renault and all these great people get the expert for the first time I went hold on a minute these are the guys blogs that I've been looking at I really should be putting stuff up there and we're Within a year of then going, actually, I should be doing the same thing. I was then lucky enough to be able to achieve that V expert status for the first time as well. So make sure you get engaged with that community. Go to go out there and see what's going on. Um, I suppose if there, there, there was a third element there, um, it, it's then what, making sure that you are then focusing once you have that area. Focus on what your specialism needs to be. Continually think. Actually, is this specialism? going in the right direction? Is it an area that is gonna be lucrative for me, for my skills? What is happening in the industry? Is it relevant? Um, And the analogy that I always said is I didn't wanna be the last mainframe uh, guy standing kind of thing. Uh, VMware was a great technology, still is a great technology, vSphere I'm obviously talking about when uh, I say VMware, let's still make that mistake. but you don't want to be the last great virtualization guy standing whilst everyone else is onto a new thing. So with technology, you're constantly evolving and seeing where you're going. So make sure your technology is relevant, make sure you're direct, and then make sure you are continually learning. Because if not, someone else is going to step above you very quickly, very easily. Yeah, and I think on the community thing, so we've got Duncan on, uh, Duncan Epping in a few, a few weeks as well, which is good. Um, and I think I, I make yourself through the community as well. And I think the thing is, is that you, you've got to, go into the community, as you mentioned, with that reciprocal value point of view. So going in thinking, right, well, someone's going to give me something, so I'm going to give them something back. Mm. Um, and even like I was, I was talking to um, an individual that 
doesn't really do anything in the community at the moment. And they're like, well, I've got nothing of any value to say. And I'm like, well, what have you been working on the last three months? And they explained it to me. I was like, well, let's go and have a conversation about that. Don't mention customer names. Don't do this. But talk about the experience, the lessons learned, the things that went well, the things that didn't go well, and all that kind of stuff. Because that is information that people want to hear. Because it may sound boring and it may be boring to you because you've been living and breathing it for three months. But for someone else in the community that is about to do the same thing, you've just made their life a lot easier. And, and when, when I started blogging, all I started doing was when I found a problem when I was doing a customer project, I documented what the problem was and how I fixed it on my blog. Now, the main reason I was doing that, I wanted to give back, but the main reason was I know that I'd find that next time. I then got to the point where you start Googling the problem when you're there and you find, you find it yourself, <laughs> which is absolutely fantastic. And in those early days, I got no comments. I got no real interaction. You don't know if anyone else is reading it. You can see numbers going up. You don't know what they mean. Um, and then I got an email from Duncan Epping saying, hi, Barry, great to see you blogging. Please, can you spell VMware correctly? It's capital V, capital M, lowercase where. And, and for me, I was like, oh, my God, Duncan's shamed me on that. But then equally, it was, <laughs> wait a minute, he was on my blog. Um, so, so that is good from that perspective. And so, so don't always look for likes, for comments and stuff like that. Your, your content will reach the relevant people. And I think if you spend too long trying to seek that, um, you may never get it, but it will come. Just go out there, think what matters to you, what's passionate, and put it out there. I've always said, like, if I go back to when I used to run in a fairly large Citrix environment, right? I sat there thinking, I want to become Jim Moyle, right? Mm -hmm. I want to become a CTP. I want to be known in the industry as a Citrix guy. For as much as I still like that idea of being a CTP, and I have just reapplied to have it again for what is now 12 years in and still not getting it. <laughs> um, <laughs> But there's a reason why I don't get it. And the reason is, is that I'm, I'm very diverse in what I engage in. I'm not just a Citrix person, mm. right? So what I get involved in kind of sits there and I think, well, is, is he a specialist? Is he a, a professional on Citrix services? And I'm like, well, probably, probably yes and no, depending mm. on the person that's listening to the conversation. I think when I was uh, filling in the application form the other night, and I'm a Citrix CTA, right? So I'm still one of, what, 70 globally, which is still fairly good, but... The CTP is a pinnacle, right, from a Citrix right. world point of view, and everyone wants to get there. And the thing, one of the questions is like, what would what would you do if you got awarded the CTP award? And my my, I sat there and like a lot of the times people put like, I'm going to create a blog post, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I just put, I'm going to open a bottle of whiskey and have a good night, right? <laughs> because if you're not already doing these things, like with the V Expert program and things as well, if you're not already in the community actively working, giving back then saying you're now going to do it because you've been given the award is counterintuitive yeah. because you should only be getting the award if you're already doing it. Definitely. So the tips for people that are applying for the expert and applying for CTPs and CTAs and the various community uh, accreditations you can get, put down the things you have been doing. And then for the things that says, what are you going to do after you've got it? Exactly the same. Yeah. What you've More already been the doing. same. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try and upsell yourself because if you haven't been doing it, then you're not going to get it. Definitely. Cool. So if we move on to industry, right? So obviously there's a lot changed since, since we started out, but what, what would you say the biggest change that you've seen is so far? Um, that's difficult because there's constant change, isn't there? There's constant change in, in, in the industry and everything that is going on. I, I, I think the biggest change um, that, that we've already touched upon is the, um, no, no longer technology for technology's sake. Uh, it is, uh, which hasn't ever been the right thing to do. But, but simply, it was a, a black art at a certain point. So you just let the let let the technology come, the department get on with doing what they're doing. We'll, we'll we'll carry on with the rest of the business. It is that ever increasing need to align with a business, to have a business uh, alignment, have a, a return on investment strategy, and all of these kind of things. Plus the role of the IT professional not being watching the the spinning uh, lights. I don't know, uh, the, the spinning this and the flashing lights. I don't know anyone that ever actually did that, but you get the concept. Um, but we no longer can spend our days making sure an infrastructure is up and running and be happy with the output of that, I don't think. If that's what you're doing in your role today, you've got to ask what is your value to that business when those stuff workloads go into the cloud. Your value needs to come into one of those two other elements that we mentioned before, deep DevOps or deep business integration. Which one of those two are you going to be uh, championing and going to Towards. yeah and i think um i heard a good thing the other day around like people that do a lot of monitoring and looking into visibility because everyone's looking into visibility at the moment right people working from home what's the threat footprints look like what's the infrastructure looking like what's the agility of the environment need to be like what extra visibility do i need and 
someone said someone made a comment the other day that said well are we just going to end up surfing the surfers right are we just going to be literally watching logs and reviewing logs and then someone reviewing that log and things it just becomes that kind of that hateful state of just never making a decision because there's too much data as well yeah. um i think if i look at like the biggest changes for me so far in the industry because i don't plan on retiring anytime soon for as much as i'd love to um <laughs> The obviously virtualization made a massive change, right? So that entire data centers of physical tarred smoke stained servers down to being a single rack potentially, right? And then moving that forward into the, the realms of enabling more productive remote workers. And then again, with the adoption of cloud now facilitating that agile, flexible expansion model that people have been, been able to take advantage of. And someone did make a comment the other week that that I don't see the value in cloud. And this is someone that said this. And I thought, well, that's, that's a pretty bold statement, okay? Have you been using collaboration software like Teams and Zoom and WebEx meetings and all that kind of stuff? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think that runs on? Mm -hmm. Right? So without cloud, in whatever guise and form that is, that wouldn't have functioned. It wouldn't have scaled to accommodate the billions of hours and users that have been using these things over the last eight months alone, mm -hmm. never mind over the last few years. And um, I think those three areas for me have been the biggest changes and growth patterns for organizations to look at. And I think if I was looking at my career again, where would I be now starting out? I'd be looking at three areas. People always need a device to connect from. People always need a network to connect to, to get access to that service. And then the third one is you always need to be able to secure that environment in some way, shape or form. Yeah. They're the three areas that if I was looking at the industry now and all that could be wrapped in DevOps and infrastructure as code and all those things, but which, which of those three pillars should I become a specialist in to then allow me to then provide value to the end users, to the services we deliver, or to the security of our organization? I think they're the three areas that I would be focusing on if I was starting yeah. out again. I think there's... Um... I think the other one to that is business intelligence and business insight, yeah. insights. It's being able to take that data and do something with it. And that, that's quite an interesting uh, area to yeah. me. And I've, I've got this ambition. I've spoke about it lots of times. I want to make technology transparent. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that you're going to look at it and not see a computer sat in front of you. It should be that it's so easy for you to know what you need to be able to do, whether that's you need to deploy a, a hundred uh, containers inside the environment. I don't want to think it's a container. I don't want to think that I need to do X, Y, Z. I don't know want to be talking talking about DevOps and Puppet and Chef and all yeah. that. I've just stuff. gone into a service catalog and said, I want 10 of them. It's done. And that's it. And I'm just buying it as a service. And for the vast majority of my customers that aren't those providers that are doing the hard work of that behind the scenes, I want it to be as simple as possible. I mm -hmm. want to get as quickly as possible to actually, how can I help your business make more profit, be more productive and offer better customer service to your customers? And I then want to go and click the buttons, arch architect the right stuff behind that to make that happen quickly and easily. That's where I see the real value in where all this is going to. Clearly, there are still going to be hundreds of IT professionals behind the scenes, like there is in the electricity industry. Yeah. I, I, I plugged in another light when I sat down for this meeting. I didn't think actually, oh, what needs to happen between the connectivity between here and here and what, what actually needs to happen. We don't think about any of that. That happens at the other end of the, of the socket kind of thing. IT is going that way. It's a service. It will be delivered yeah. as a service. We've just got to figure out how to best consume it as technologists. Yeah, and, and, and touching on the data point you mentioned, it's like data is now more valuable than gold and oil, right? Yeah. You can create new revenue streams from it. You can make better informed decisions and all that kind of stuff. You can start to look for using an AI and ML services, services for the potential cure for cancer and all that kind of stuff, like Pat Gelsing was mentioning at VMworld and stuff. And I think those, those kind of things are really important. I think people coming into the industry and looking at being data scientists or looking into how they manipulate and make sense of data is it's a good area to be in. I think it's a different type of technical person uh, to understand that and correlate that data than the people that we're probably used to engaging with in, on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think it's 100% a required role in most organizations now. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that is a really interesting place to get into. And I think that, that there can also be too much focus on being that data scientist or something like that. Oh, that's not something I'm never going to be. I'm never going to be able to write an algorithm. Why are you going to do that? But start, start at the other end. Be the person that actually can figure out what the value is, figure mm -hmm. out actually what you want to achieve, because that data scientist will be out there somewhere to help you. 
And that data, data scientist will all be well and good, but he needs to be directed or she needs to be directed as to what needs to happen, where can that value be? Yeah. And then along that journey, you may become that data scientist and you may have both sides of it. But if you are the person that isn't just the data scientist, but is, has the business brains, business acumen, and you're the data scientist, you're going to be worth double what a data scientist that knows how to go and plug the data and, and get the yeah. answers out of that question. Yeah, that's, that's, couldn't agree with that more. So if you think about the current pandemic, right, and the way that it's, that it's positively and negatively impacted ourselves, our customers, what do you see the most positive and negative things are you've seen over the last few months? Um, I, I, the positive thing is, I mean, I've, I've been an end user computing guy for, for, for too many years kind of thing. Um, we no longer need to convince organizations that they need to be adopting technologies that allow flexible working. The businesses that are surviving, the businesses that are transforming, the businesses that were able to do this as simple as possible were those that were adopting those flexible working technologies already. Um, so the, the best thing is it has pushed that along. Organizations now need to start ripping off all the sticky plasters that they put in place to make stuff work during COVID and figure out how they make this more permanent. We've seen all the big players, VMware, Microsoft, everyone go, we are not requesting people come back into the office in the future. We're changing our practices permanently now to allow that flexible working. And we need to encourage more people to do that. And even if that is not gonna be your uh, staff strategy today, let's make sure that the technology is already there who knows how this uh, virus is going to morph and, and change over the years. We might get vaccines and then two years later, it might have morphed and changed and come back again. We don't know what that's been. I think, um, I think it was Bill Gates. I think there's a documentary on, on Netflix where he actually said 15 years ago that there's going to be a pandemic, something like this, that will happen within the next 15 to 20 years. Yeah. Lo and behold, 17 years into that plan, we are where we are now. Definitely. Right. So he's, he's work something out somewhere definitely and, so, and so people now, weren't ready for it now is the time to make those changes permanent and also look at your business model to make sure you can be relevant in a continual changing uh, environment and certain people will be able to do that um certain people won't i mean looking at things like the um events industry and and theaters and stuff like that is so difficult there is innovation that can happen in that place but part of that is a personal experience that um is so difficult to recreate where we are at the moment and i think that's the negative side of this the the toll on on people ultimately whether that's business is failing or whatever it all comes down to people at the end of the day whether that is mental health whether that is the loss of jobs yeah. whether that is any form of hardship that that really is the most difficult thing during this period yeah my my, um, my brother's a, a performer a musician right he's been on the disney cruise liner um, performing for i don't know how many years now and then obviously they all got docked and everything else and then he, he's had to pivot his career completely right because no one's really paying for artists right now yeah. and you can only so long live on people giving you tips on twitch and all that kind of stuff yeah, right? yeah. um so the see so he's had to pivot back into what is what we probably class as a normal job ultimately rather than being a performer and doing what he's used to doing um it's gonna be interesting for him i think to see what he does over the next five years now and whether he actually transitions back into that performing role once this is all gone or whether he actually thinks do you know what it's time to to focus on a career that's that's a little bit more stable maybe yeah and, and i hope we can get to an environment where we can all enjoy those kind of things and people can be successful i mean there was obviously the the awful government campaign of uh, should the ballerina retrain to become in cyber security and I, I, initially i looked at it and thought oh wow that's absolutely fantastic they're encouraging people to join the cyber security industry really good to see the government promoting that and then i thought hold on a minute there's another context to this which is they're suggesting performers then uh, look for different careers and um, yeah, but it, it's very difficult uh, Difficult at the moment. Um, we, we all need to make sure we are relevant, but hopefully we can get to a place where we're able to enjoy things like performances and shows and stuff like that. We, we, we've all got a champion making that possible, however we can, as soon as we can, in the safest possible way. Yeah, definitely. And um, is, what's taking your interest in technology at the moment? What's the, the one technology area that's making you think, well, that's interesting, that's cool? I, I'm Mr. Microsoft at the moment, and um, uh, Microsoft 365, um, mainly the productivity elements to it are uh, an area that I'm, I'm just so passionate about. Um, I've, I've been a virtualization guy. I've been a deep technical guy. I've done storage, DR, end user computing and all those kind of things. But the simplest things about making technology that is already available to people available 
make it so it's easy to use, make sure that it's being adopted and really changing the way people are work. Um, I, I'm, I've been really excited about Microsoft Lists recently and the yeah. possibilities that Microsoft Lists combine with Power Automate and Microsoft Teams and all of those kind of things you're able to do by just stitching together very simple technologies, you're able to create quite interesting and useful um, scenarios for people. So I'm, I'm geeking out a lot at the moment about the Microsoft 365 portfolio, connecting things together, getting things working, aligning it to business side. Um, yeah. So yeah, so, so so that specifically teams and, and and the stuff that's coming out around there. However, that that that's just that's the bit that I'm able to tinker with, the, the bit that yeah. I'm able to look at. There's clearly a raft of other technologies then that, that I'm championing to to be bought up by the rest of the organisation and our customers. Yeah, definitely. I think um, one of the things I think I mentioned earlier before we started recording, um, I'm launching obviously this this channel is doing the canoe and industry insight stuff, which is now releasing on two videos a week. But then also on a Tuesday in the next week or so, we're going to start releasing a tech tips or Tuesday technology um, video, which is going to basically be covering off things like Office 365, M365, little tricks and tips you can take along the way, five minutes short, little snippet videos that hopefully will give even people that aren't in IT something to take away and maybe make themselves more productive. Um, and also some technology reviews and all that kind of stuff. Right? I've just pre-ordered an Xbox Series X, so might as well do that, right? Like everyone else <laughs> on the planet, um, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's going to be an interesting thing for me personally, just to try and understand what I do that makes me productive. Yeah. And then share that with people to see if they find the same thing or even come back and say, actually, if you thought about doing this to make me more productive again, it's going to be great. I can't um, wait. I've been a productivity geek for a long time. I think it was uh, Scott Lowe, the uh, most uh, well member from the, the VMware community that introduced me to the getting things done methodology. So the David Allen book around planning your time and being productive, he, he put a very good blog post about his um, process, probably about 10 years ago on his blog, which I followed meticulously and then uh, uh, read the book at that point. And that really got me onto this kind of hunger for how to be more productive, how to be more organized. Um, and um, another book that's on the shelf behind me somewhere is uh, Productivity Ninja. So the Graham Alcott book, it, absolutely fantastic. And um, recently did a, a blog post on, uh, on uh, our blog Define Tomorrow, uh, where we were looking at, um, how you could use the technologies inside Microsoft Planner and Teams to apply what you could learn in Productivity Ninja and, um, mm. and getting things done uh, into the context of, of Microsoft 365. And it's quite interesting that actually if you do it and stick by it, how much more easier your life can be to, to know what you're working on and what you're focusing on. Yeah, definitely. And I know that because I've, I've just transitioned back from a Mac for many, many years, back to a Windows endpoint, right? And it's, it's amazed me on how much slicker the M365 portfolio is on a Windows device compared to a Mac. Right. And it's strange because I, I thought it was pretty good anyway on the Mac, but then now I'm on the Windows device, things just seem to work that little bit better. Yeah. And it, obviously Microsoft on Microsoft is going to deliver that, but it's kind of sat there thinking, wow, well, this is powerful now. I can actually make change and do something more meaningful. Um, so organizations obviously invest a lot in technology to deliver whatever services they need to deliver. Is there anything that you see that, that people are undervaluing and not investing in that they should? Um, uh, it, it's a difficult question. I, I, I think the area that, and it kind of goes back to what we were saying, I think data is our biggest challenge. Organizations have so much data available to them um, that not enough time, not enough energy, not enough simple products are available to help organizations get real value from their data as quickly as possible. Um, nobody ever deletes an email. Nobody ever deletes a file that's on a file server. No one ever clears out an ERP or CRM system. All that information is always there. But there's so few organizations that are leveraging the data that is available to them. So I think that's something that is quite exciting um, to understand how that can be democratized, how it can be easier for organizations to see value from their data moving forward. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, just just for me, just on, on the whole data thing, it's like the amount of people that well, take the, the NHS example, right, where they used Excel to capture all that information and couldn't provide national statistics and nothing the, the information in the right way because excel had limitations right why in the first place were they using excel yeah. i do not know um but there's those kind of things i think people need to be aware of that the office productivity suite is a fantastic way of doing, doing certain things but there's other things in that suite that people should take advantage of to deliver the right outcome 
like yeah. using a back-end database with a front-end application, whether that's written with Power Platforms or not, whether it's just flow with a, 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 a database in the back-end somewhere or whatever it might be with Microsoft Forms front in it, right? It could be as simple as that, yeah. just not Excel. Or even worse, Access 97. And, and Microsoft's not always the right answer. I mean, if, if, if you're probably doing something like a, a test and trace system or something like that, and I don't know, I'm not the right person to architect that. I was a SQL DBA, but I probably wouldn't even put that in SQL, to be honest with you. I'd probably be looking at some Oracle database with some proper team of people bringing that together. But again, I'm not the person that would architect that. Um, it's certainly I am someone that can champion a technology. I've been the VMware guy for a long time and now slowly becoming the Microsoft 365 guy kind of thing. But I've never been at the point where that is the only answer. Sorry, what was the question again? Because I've already given you the answer. It was vSphere, it was uh, 365. <laughs> yeah. You've really got to be open to go, actually, this doesn't sound right. How about I get a specialist in in this and we can see if that looks to be the right solution for you. Um, so lightning question. So final, final round now. Um, what as your last technology purchase? I don't know, I buy something every day pretty much. <laughs> like Amazon delivery is constant. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, E8's e coming to my house. Uh, the last one, oh, I, as, as I say, I've just bought a 15 year old car. So I bought a, a, an FM Bluetooth uh, transceiver because I couldn't be bothered to change the stereo. I'm keeping it original. So I want the factory fitted head unit in there. So I've bought a, a, an FM transceiver. So that, that's a really old school. I've not bought one of those for 15 years, probably. Yeah, uh, awesome. But yeah, uh, wow. that, that, that was the last thing I purchased. I'm, I'm surrounded by other tech here, but it, 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 it's all the boring uh, stuff that we've all probably put on our desks over the lockdown. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, who's your biggest inspiration? I don't know, that's a really difficult question, but it's a quick fire round. Um, there are people in the community like Alan Renault that for me, lived down the road for me and has done what he wanted to do on his career, um, uh, moving over to uh, the States and being part of VMware. But there's a lot of those original uh, VMware user group people that I think have come an awful long way um, that have built careers up around me. and, and um, they all inspire me, uh, th th those people, Jane Rimmer and all the good that she's done for, for the technical community. So I inspired by those people that I have kind of grown up around, matured my career around and seen what they have been able to achieve. Yeah, definitely. And what do you say work-life balance means to you? Being able to relax. That, that, that's the most important thing. I, I've, I've seen the challenge I see with work-life balance is not the fact that you go away from your, your desk at six o'clock, it's the fact that you're able to stop thinking about it at six o'clock or if it's seven o'clock, it doesn't really matter. And, and that for me is, is the constant struggle to be able to get to the point where you don't need to think about it whilst you're on holiday in the evenings and things like that. Yeah. Um, what's your favourite book? Um, probably Productivity Ninja. It's, it's the one that I mentioned, but I've read it so many times now. But um, the, the, there's another book there that's done by Graham um, uh, Alcott. Um, that is all around nutrition and, and stuff like that is in the same range um, that I've worked with uh, Colette on there personally around my nutrition, but anything that's easy and does it. I'm not really a fiction guy. Um, uh, Jack Reacher is, is, my, is my only uh, uh, fiction books that I like and I've got plenty of those on my Kindle and stuff like that. Cool. And um, what would you say the most important thing to you is? Family. Yeah, yeah. It's a standard answer from everyone, right? I think yeah. uh, if anyone said anything different, they're, they're probably going to get a battering from their partners or kids or whatever. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> family is everything. Um, what would be your words of wisdom if it was a tweet? Um, <laughs> probably, uh, probably uh, uh, but think about yourself. Think about yourself first. I, I think people feel very uh, selfish by doing so, but look after yourself first, look after your well being get your balance right, and then you can look after your family, you can progress your career, you can buy the car that you want. All of those kind of things come secondary to looking after yourself, first of all. Perfect, and favorite song? I, I, I have an eclectic uh, taste in music. I couldn't tell you uh, one. Uh, good uh, Green Day, it would be a Green Day song, uh, but equally I'm no good at remembering songs. Uh, Time, of your <laughs> life by, Time of Your Life by Green Day. Perfect, uh, fill in the blank. The new normal is? Not normal. Good answer. Must watch TV show? Oh, um, Suits. Yeah, I love Suits. Yeah, I'm, I'm gut I, I've just binged it all. I'm gutted it's finished. It's, uh, I know, I, I'm now trying to find the next best thing. Yeah, I'm thing. watching White Collar at the moment, which is was quite good. Not, not as good as Suits, but uh, yeah. And um, last question, favourite junk food? 
uh, Chinese takeaway. Yeah, good old Chinese takeaway. Definitely. I think on that note, I think we should uh, probably call it quits and go and get some uh, some some food. That's so good. again, thank you very much for your time, mate. It's been fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Kyle.